This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. Do you want to be more creative? Of course, we all do. So find out how easy it is to learn at home to explore new skills and get lost in creativity. Just take out your mouse right now and click this link below to find out how easy it is with the online learning community Skillshare. Choose from any one of these thousands of inspiring classes. Digital illustration, techniques for pencil portraits, project management, character animation, remixing dance music, social media strategy, or you can learn how to shoot and edit portrait photography from fashion photographer Jessica Kobesi. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So don't wait, start exploring your creativity today. That's the link in the description, click now. Thank you and on with the show. Critical acclaim came too late for the Carpenters. We've owned it just they wouldn't get their due until roughly the 90s, well after Karen Carpenter's two young death from anorexia in 1983. By that point, thanks to the forces of nostalgia, few key endorsements from celebrities like Sonic Youth and Madonna, and the emotional power of Karen's tragic life story, you no longer had to feel guilty for liking the Carpenters. But that wasn't the case during their heyday. In the early 70s, as the Vietnam War raged and the kids got into protest music, acid rock, hard rock, hard funk, political soul, there was Richard and Karen Carpenter, the brother and sister duo who ruled the eternally disreputable easy listening genre. Elevator music claimed the hipsters, out of touch with their own generation, soft music for soft people, clean, wholesome, nauseating. Critics that don't like us are, 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 are never knock, never knock not, how never we no, sing. No, they only don't like yeah. what we stand for. Richard and Karen were aware of that image, and they hated it. One reviewer noted, every time Karen and Richard are interviewed, they complain about cynical old music critics who put them down for being wholesome and clean. Sometimes they get so worked up on the subject that they let out with something like, gosh darn those old smarty pants anyway. In time, those critics would indeed learn to appreciate the sheer heartbreaking power of Karen's voice and Richard's brilliant arrangements and production. But while they were active, coolness was just not a thing they would have. What they did have was hits. Lots and lots of hits. Don't you remember you told me you loved me, baby? Between 1970 and 1976, the Carpenters managed to rack up six top ten albums and twelve top ten hits, including three number ones. Richard and Karen may have chafed against their uncool image, but I'm sure they managed to console themselves with their swimming pool full of gold records. But that also does not last forever. Their exhausting tour schedule left them less and less time and energy to work on new albums. In terms of both quality and sales, they were on an alarming downward trend. But more than that, they were just overexposed. The public was tired of them. Their sound had gotten stale. So when they began work on their next album in 1977, the decision was obvious. It was time for a new direction. But what new direction, you might ask? All of them. Calling occupants of interplanetary craft. We've been your... You've got to be kidding me. Is this real? It is. And believe it or not, this is just one variety of the many wildly off-brand tracks that make up their eighth album, Passage. Critics called it ambitious, daring, even experimental, and they also called it transparently desperate. The Carpenters threw everything at the wall trying to make something stick, and the result was by some distance the most confusing record of their career, a record that prompted only puzzled indifference from the public. Never again during their existence would the Carpenters see a top 10 single or a gold record. The Carpenters take us through a passage. A passage that led them directly out of the hit parade and into the weirdest moment of their career. This is Train Records. I was not alive during the 70s. I realized that there are so many things about it that are 
beyond my grasp because it wasn't my time. But everything I know tells me that there is absolutely no way that the goddamn Carpenters starred in a sci-fi themed TV special called Space Encounters. The Carpenters Space Encounters, starring Richard and Karen Carpenter. This cannot possibly have actually happened. How did the Carpenters, the normiest, most middle of the road, most toothpaste ad looking two people of the entire 70s, wind up on primetime TV singing to and about aliens? I think he's from out of town. <laughs> to understand this, you have to understand the state of their career in 1977. After a string of chart toppers, their last couple albums did eventually go gold, but they moved pretty sluggishly. and. Pretty much everyone agrees they also weren't that good. By this point, a and Records were pretty concerned about the trajectory of their biggest act, so they went to Richard and they broke the news to him. It was time for him to step down as producer. According to Richard, he agreed with them, which is pretty surprising to me since by 77 that was basically his only job. He didn't really sing anymore, he played piano, but anyone can do that. His role was that he picked or wrote all the songs and produced and arranged them, that was his contribution. But Richard, who was fighting a drug problem at the time, says he was kind of happy to be doing less. The facts were undeniable. They needed hits, and Richard's work wasn't cutting it anymore. It was time for new blood. One problem. They couldn't find anybody. All the major names turned them down. That is also shocking to me. Like, yeah, they weren't quite in their prime anymore, but their prime hadn't been that long ago. Well, that's showbiz. You go from hot to not like that. So if they couldn't find a new producer, it was up to Richard to become a new producer. So for the first time, he would write no new songs, and instead of the oldies covers that they'd been relying on, he would look elsewhere for new material. Secretly, I think he wanted the excuse to stretch. Richard Carpenter was classically trained, he had wide eclectic tastes, and after all the negative reviews, he wanted to show off. And so, all the pre-release hype for the new album, Passage, stressed how new and varied it was. Richard and Karen take us on a fantastic journey across new musical terrain. Passage is a departure in every way. Production, material, style, arrangement. But this ain't your daddy's, Carpenters. I'm sure record buyers at the time had to be skeptical. I mean, it's the Carpenters. How weird could it be? Well, you know what? Let's put this baby on the record player and see what comes out. Kind of smooth up in here. Okay, yeah, I have definitely not heard the Carpenters ever do this kind of slinky jazz thing before. They are definitely announcing their intent to change things up on this opening track, which is entitled Buana She No Home. Okay, that's a bad sign. Please tell me Karen Carpenter is not about to put on an accent and play a non white character. No, 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 don't worry, it's not as bad as it sounds. No blackface up in here. She's just. Addressing her housekeeper. Don't you ever invite your boyfriend here? And the title, that's just Miss Carpenter condescendingly instructing the poor woman how to stonewall any callers. Somebody knocks on the telephone ring, said, why does she know? Oh, and uh, threatening to deport her back to Ecuador if she doesn't do it right. Got to learn these words that I know you will, or I'll send you right back to Guayaquil. Said Juana she knows. Said Juana she knows. I want you to speak the English right. Really, uh, really putting the Karen and Karen Carpenter, huh? Okay, I was not prepared to listen to Karen Carpenter racistly berate her maid today. And for the record, Buana is Swahili. You'd hear it in old safari movies. It's not Spanish. So, uh, yeah, there's layers to this. But, before you pull out your yikes gifts, I think I should say that I'm pretty sure this song is ironic. It makes more sense if you hear the original. It's from light jazz guitarist Michael Franks and it was inspired by a time he let a friend house sit for him. Couldn't find out any more than that, but uh, sure hope his cleaning lady got a big tip and an apology when he got home. So I can't say for sure, but to me, this sounds like a character piece. You know, one of those late 70s kind of sleazy, sarcastic songs you get from Steely Dan or Randy Newman, Rupert Holmes. 
I could be way off. Maybe it's supposed to be about how the help needs to be put in their place sometimes. But to me, this is a song about an asshole. I hear it, and I can immediately picture the open shirt and sunglasses hung over douchebag singing it. <laughs> Why is Karen Carpenter singing this? I'm sure this song hits different these days. All the liner notes say about it is that the song is about the master-servant problem, which... Okay. But, even in the unwoke 70s, the narrator is clearly supposed to be a dick. Being an entertaining dick is a rare skill owned by only a select few. A select few that does not include sweet, innocent girl next door, Karen Carpenter. It's like Carly Rae Jepsen trying to be Lana Del Rey. It's wrong. Her interpretation of this song is bizarre. Step one, does she know Step one, does she know like, it's not even that she's trying to play the mean girl and failing, which would be bad enough. It's more like she doesn't even know what the song's about. Maybe she's the one who doesn't know English. Richard at least seems to be having fun. The band is riffing and vamping all over the place, but this is such a bad fit for Karen. So clearly, this is not going to be the lead single. When it came time for that, they went with something a little more neutral. Exhaling on a sailing ship to What they led off with for this album cycle was something called All You Get From Love Is A Love Song. Oh, it's a dirty old shame when all you get from love is a love song. It's got you laying up. As the lead single, this is, to put it mildly, the safe choice, especially for this album. Karen really believed this was going to be a smash, and it's not hard to see why. Cause the best love song Out of all the Carpenter singles, it is probably the boppiest, I guess. I tend to not like the Carpenter's upbeat tracks. Upbeat the Carpenter's is just the Captain and Tennille, and I don't need that. But this, this is pretty alright. Might not make my top 10 Carpenter songs, but it's pretty nice. This should have been a hit. It was not. The Carpenter's were pretty accustomed to their lead singles making the top 5. This only barely cracked the top 40. It's hard to say what went wrong, except that the trends had turned against them. I've seen some suggestions that the Carpenters couldn't compete with disco, but I don't believe that. Soft Rock still had quite a major hold on the charts. I think it was just the Carpenters themselves being so uncool at that point. A few years earlier, yes, this would have been a smash, but by 77 they needed an all-time banger to get back into people's graces, and this wasn't it. Richard has said that it was also one of his favorites, but on his website, which has extensive information for all their songs, he just has absolutely nothing to add to that. It just doesn't make for much of a story. He's right, it doesn't. I got nothing to say about this either. It's a fine little song. It was not what they needed. After this on the album comes another more conventional ballad. I guess they wanted to assure listeners right away that the new Carpenters weren't going to be that different. The label was considering this for the second single, and we know it had commercial potential because country singer Ann Murray made a country hit out of it a couple years later. In another time, it would have been a single. But ultimately it was decided against. We've tried the safe path, the safe path didn't work. It's time to get nuts. In your mind you have capacity now we come to the most singularly mystifying song in the entire Carpenter's catalog. Calling occupants of interplanetary craft, parentheses, the recognized anthem of World Contact Day. Bet you didn't know World Contact Day had an official anthem recognized by the entirety of humanity. I love that this is actual cover art for a Carpenter song, by the way. Calling occupants of interplanetary craft Calling occupants of interplanetary most extraordinary craft. <sighs> okay. Calling occupants comes to us from the band Klaatu, an odd ELO ish Canadian band, most notable for a persistent rumor that they were secretly the Beatles, reunited and recording incognito. They were not actually the Beatles. 
They released this heavily orchestrated, multi-suite, seven-minute prog rock epic about welcoming aliens to Earth, and it did become a minor mid-chart hit in 1976. Richard found this song and loved it, and just had to take his own shot at it. Right now in our all request line, I've got Mike Ledgewood on the phone. Hey, babe, what would you like to hear? We are observing your Hey, babe, I'm sorry, I can't hear you too well. You're going to have to speak a little closer into the phone. We are observing your Earth. This is part of the actual song, for the record. Calling occupants of interplanetary craft. This is, and I say this kindly, such nerd shit. It is so uncool, in the complete opposite way that the Carpenters were uncool. There is basically no way that they should be singing this. But the timing actually turned out in their favor. As Richard and Karen were finishing up the album, theaters started showing a little film called Star Wars. And suddenly, science fiction was so lucrative that every celebrity got in on it. Jimmy Carter had Darth Vader figurines on his desk in the Oval Office. Pete Rose played an entire game wearing a Chewbacca outfit. I'm kidding. But there was a big sci-fi wave that swept up everybody. Hence the Space Encounter special built around this song as its climax. With your mind you have ability to form And transmit thought energy for I have had to listen to this song many, many times to do this review, and each and every time I hear this song, I love it more. This song fucking rules. Please come in peace, we beseech you. The Carpenter singing this is one of the most inspiredly random things I've ever heard. The original is, you know, it's, it's fine but it's missing something, and that something is Karen Carpenter. She really puts it over the top. She makes it more than just a novelty. Like, there was always something kind of otherworldly about her voice, so she fits shockingly well in science fiction. Plus, it's just a very warm and hopeful song about making new friends among the stars. We are your friends. I cannot think of a better peace ambassador for humanity than Karen Carpenter. I am being dead serious. I do really love this. This may be my new favorite Carver song of all time. It really is just that good. You all get why this is career suicide, right? Like, yes, we also had songs in the 70s like Rocket Man or Space Oddity, but those were made by people with mystique. And also they were metaphors for loneliness and isolation. Calling Occupants is a song about aliens, and the aliens are a metaphor for aliens. The only hit song I can think of that is this kind of weird and impenetrable is Mr. Roboto, which was a hit, but it was also a definite career ender. Where can you possibly go from here? That said, this was a tiny bit of a hit. It actually did slightly better than the last single, and it even went top 10 in the UK and number one in Ireland. And the fact that this weird off-brand, unmarketable single did even that much is, you know, I think that's a testament to how good it is and how hard they worked on it. I mean, give Richard credit too, it sounds fucking great, way better than the original. They said it took longer to make than their entire third album. And yet, believe it or not, it is neither the longest nor the most elaborate song on the record. You know, since they were already renting out the LA Philharmonic, they decided to have them do another song too. And, oh boy, this is a song you need a Philharmonic for. Don't cry for me. Yes, we have now made it to the show tunes portion of the evening. The Carpenters will be performing their version of this song, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, from the musical Evita. It won't be easy, you think it's strange. This strikes me as a very odd selection, because Karen Carpenter was not exactly a grand diva of the stage. She was a brilliant singer with a mic in her hand, but Without one, she couldn't exactly belt to the rafters, so this was all pretty unexpected. But, as I listened to her interpretation, uh, I think it helped me realize something about it that uh, I didn't really get until now, which is that I hate the song. 
all versions of it. I'm not a theater guy, granted, but I never had trouble understanding memory or I dreamed a dream. But the appeal of this song has always been completely lost on me. It's so slow and so boring. It's just a hookless, interminable dirge of a song. It's meaningless outside the context of the musical, and it's insufferable and condescending within it. I don't get this song. I probably never will. So, that being my opinion, I guess I don't really have any way to judge whether the Carpenters do justice to Andrew Lloyd Webber's most overrated song. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Just analyzing it on a pure intellectual level, Karen Carpenter seems like an odd fit. I've never really thought of her as a Broadway kind of singer. I certainly never thought of her as Ava Perone. The entire musical portrays her as a ruthless bitch. We've already established that that's not Karen Carpenter. On the other hand, I've never thought this song connected with the character, so actually maybe it makes more sense for someone softer like Karen Carpenter to sing it. I kept my promise. Don't keep your distance. And you know what, in hindsight, Karen would also die young and tragically and leave behind her adoring public. With that in mind, it kind of works even better. So, you know, I'll never feel this song, but I can see it. I see why, in this case, Karen Carpenter thought she could pull off a show tune. In fact, it probably made perfect sense at the time, since Don't Cry For Me Argentina was not even a show tune, because Evita was not yet a show. It was a concept album released by Lloyd Webber the year before, and it wouldn't hit the stage until a year after. So at this point in time, Elaine Page hadn't touched it, Patti LuPone hadn't touched it, Madonna hadn't touched it, Glacier hadn't fucking touched it. Karen Carpenter is probably doing only the second version of this song anyone has ever heard. And it might be that newness that explains Richard Carpenter's very strangest decision on the entire album. Which is to cover not just the song, but the entire scene. Yes, before Don't Cry For Me Argentina, we get the entirety of On the Balcony of the Casa Rosada, the song that precedes it on the album. Did he think we needed context? Cause we didn't. Julie Covington's original version was a big hit single just on its own. But Richard decided that for three full minutes before Karen shows up as Ava, we needed to hear her being introduced by Juan Perón and Che Guevara. Yes, it's the only Carpenter's album to feature Che Guevara. And his wife, the first lady of Argentina. It is so jarring. On the Balcony of the Casa Rosada is a filler song. It's exposition. I didn't buy the Avita soundtrack. I bought a Carpenter's album. I don't care what's going on in the story. Like, imagine if you were playing a video game and it stopped for a 20 minute cutscene that's just the funeral monologue from Steel Magnolias. I, I don't think I can take this. What is it doing here? What does this have to do with anything? Okay, let's finish this part up. Ooh, that was a lot. Let's dial it back a little on the elaborateness. Our next song is called Sweet Sweet Smile, originally by Juice Newton, who would later become a big country star in the 80s. When I wake up in the morning and I see you there, I always whisper a little prayer, I gotta see your sweet sweet smile every day. Okay, at least with country music, we're on firmer ground than the other genre experiments. The Carpenters had dipped their toes into country music before. Jambalaya, crawfish pie, billy gumbo. For tonight, down we're gonna see Mama Cheryl Neal. Okay, uh, I actually really don't like the Carpenter's Country songs. They're pretty painful. Carpenter's took a very white bread, antiseptic, 70s, easy listening approach to it. They were honestly better fitted for prog rock. So this one, uh, you know, it's not quite as sterile as their butchering of Hank Williams I was just showing you, but it's still pretty dorky. Their version of country leans pretty hard on the corn pone aspects of country music rather than the grit. I don't like it. And neither did the mainstream public. It was the third single and it didn't go anywhere on the pop charts. But it was their first crossover hit on the country charts, so uh, someone liked it. Yeah, I don't know. Not for me. But really, this is nowhere near awkward enough for this show. I promise you awkward and you're gonna get awkward. So get ready everyone. 
for the Carpenters Go Calypso. Yes, just like the Simpsons. Man smart. The woman is smart. Man smart. The woman is smart. Man, this thing's really getting out of hand. And I mean exactly like the Simpsons. The song Homer and Marge were singing is the exact same one Richard and Karen will be performing for you today. It is Man Smart, Woman Smarter by Harry Belafonte. That's it right. The woman is smarter. <sighs> and if I thought the Carpenters were too white bread for country music, you can imagine what I'm going to think of this. Okay, this is Karen performing it on Space Encounters with sitcom star Suzanne Somers because it's the 70s and we pile celebrities on top of each other. Like, this is not even really Calypso anymore. This is based more on the clattering Robert Palmer Boogie Woogie version, which is still not nearly white enough for the Carpenters. Like, Palmer was a very bluesy, soulful singer. Karen is not. Which is really just the entire problem with the whole album. Listening to this album, you can really picture Richard being all like, Ha! Take this, all you critics who dismissed us as lightweights. I am a serious artist with so many more facets than you can possibly imagine. I can and will do anything, and you will realize that every preconception you had about me was totally wrong. And next to him, you got Karen Carpenter being like, Hi, I'm Karen Carpenter. The only song we haven't looked at is a more normal track called Two Sides, which is, I guess that's kind of the thesis of the album, right? There are two sides of the Carpenters. Well, there's two sides. There's another side of me. The most negative review I could find had a brutal dunk in it, saying like, yeah, we sure are seeing Karen's other side. It's her left side, and it looks quite a bit like the right side. Like, I do kind of wonder if when given the imperative to experiment, Richard started leaning into his own strengths at the expense of hers. You know, jazz, orchestras, prog rock. I'm just saying, everyone's always jealous of the lead singer. You put the drummer in charge, you get more drum solos. And from there, the album ends with the second single, Calling Occupants. And since I like that song, we're going to let it play. You send the message, we declare we'll contact them. Nice. So that was Passage. It did not do well. In fact, it was their first since their debut to not even go gold. But was it bad? I've read some excerpts to you from the most negative review I found, but that isn't really the tenor of most of the coverage I read. Most critics were just like, huh. And huh was not a strong enough response to get them back into the limelight. What with Karen's failing health and Richard's stint in rehab, they only ever managed to put out one more studio album. They cracked the top 20 one last time, and then Karen tragically passed. Was Passage really a disaster? It's hard to say. I'm not sure if the album ended their career, or if it only failed to stop their downward slide. Karen did a frustrated interview where she was like, Radio doesn't want the old sound, they don't want the new sound, what do you want from us, cause we'll do it! And it may just be that the public didn't want anything from them at that point. And if they did, it was gonna have to be a lot stronger than this. Like, I hesitate to call this a bad album, or even to say that it has any truly terrible songs, but it is a disjointed and incoherent album. It's hard to not respect the ambition, and I'd love to tell you that it's an overlooked gem, but ultimately it just does not really work. But you know what? Tonight, I'm gonna pull out this album, and I'll look at the stars, and I'll imagine that somewhere, some way, Karen Carpenter is up there, in a giant flying saucer, also enjoying this ridiculous but somewhat wonderful piece of music she made. I wish you a good night and a happy World Contact Day to you all.